legs up the niggas bullshit Can't stand the heat, niggas stay the fuck up out the kitchen Did I mention, I bars, no competition When I step in the room, nigga, pay attention Ain't no flinching, I'm my chill on the grind you Don't believe me, fuck boy, acts around Could see no red where the game, nigga, I'm laced with it I'm slick like I'm Rick, but I ain't caught no case with it Game of fishing, nigga, I move stay from state with it You looking for me, bitch, I'm all up in your face with it All that weak bullshit get replaced with it Nigga acting all hard, but he can't with it I'm here with the grind, you don't wanna see me, though Gangs of paradise, you can call me Coolio I grind, sun up the sun down, Julio Never leave the house, nigga, without that Julio Ask the wrong question, acting like a foolio I'm a pro with them tools like a studio Cock back dead aim like a calico Can see nowhere respect the name Really know Now when I hit the scene I make a big impact In my hands it's that gas I'm smoking loud packs In my jeans watch your phone and a lot of stacks Wanna know how I get it all you do is ass All you gotta do is ass All you gotta do is ass Are you thinking about getting your GED diploma? Well, here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we've got a number of pep talks that can motivate you. Sometimes things don't always turn out the way you want them to. You know that feeling? People look at you and don't believe in you. You want some gentle encouragement. Then you're on your way to your GED diploma and a better life. But I know you're probably just a little bit nervous. You can find it in yourself to take that first step. You can improve your future. You can do this. I know you can. You need to start pushing yourself. Now get your game face on and take the first step towards a better life. Hurry up. Don't make me repeat myself. Whatever level of motivation you need to get your GED diploma, we've got a pep talk that's right for you. Call 1-877-38-YOUR-GED or visit yourged.org for your pep talk and find free GED classes in your area. GED is a registered trademark of the American Council on Education. Brought to you by Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Tonight, historic deal. The nuclear agreement that could change the world. The White House says it will keep Iran from getting the bomb. Opponents say it will do the opposite, setting up a new showdown. Crippling floods, a state of emergency in Kentucky. At least two dead, several missing as flooding sweeps away buildings. We're there on the ground. Sole survivor, a plane crash in the Pacific Northwest kills a couple but spares their granddaughter tonight her harrowing trek through the wild to save. And far out, a nine-year NASA mission to Pluto sends back awe-inspiring photos from the edge of a solar system. Is it another giant leap for mankind? Nightly News begins right now. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. First, the deal, now the sell. With today's historic agreement to curb Iran's nuclear program, the Obama White House tonight is trying to convince nervous Mideast neighbors and the American Congress that there was no better alternative. The U.S. and five other nations struck the deal with Iran overnight, offering Iran relief from economic sanctions in exchange for limits on nuclear production. But questions over compliance and verification, along with Iran's history of provoking instability in the Middle East, are planting seeds of doubt in high places. We have full coverage tonight. We begin with our chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell from Vienna. Andrea? Good evening, Lester. Well, after years and decades, in fact, of calling each other the great Satan and the axis of evil, Iran and the U.S. are now entering uncharted territory, a diplomatic agreement to reduce Iran's suspected nuclear threat. John Kerry and his Iranian counterpart, Javad Zarif, weary but celebrating the deal to reduce Iran's nuclear capability in exchange for billions of dollars with the end of crippling sanctions. Years in the making, it came together after 18 long days and nights of intense talks. Kerry even personally edited the final draft at 3 o'clock this morning, after a midnight call, Vienna time, to the president in the Oval Office. This deal offers an opportunity to move in a new direction. We should seize it. 
Iran accepts limits on its nuclear production for 10 years and on nuclear fuel and equipment for 15 years. Iran promises more access for U.N. inspectors to suspect sites, but with notice. But Iran gets an economic lifeline, hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief, once it meets those nuclear commitments, perhaps by the end of the year. Re-entry into the global banking system. And five to eight years from now, an end to the U.N. arms and ballistic missiles embargo. So how do you justify down the road... Uh, taking off the arms embargo on conventional weapons and ballistic missiles. The United States doesn't lose anything, Andrea, by giving them the opportunity to prove this is a peaceful program. What's the alternative? Go to war now? You want to, I mean, everybody want to say automatically, let's bomb Iran? I mean, is that the alternative? But the deal is a tough sell with critics in Washington and Tehran, as Iran's foreign minister acknowledges. We have people in Iran who have a lot of mistrust. Uh, in the ability and the intention of the United States to live up to this agreement and to try to uh, implement its part of the deal. So it's going to be a difficult uh, exercise. And in a call today, President Obama tried to reassure Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu, but sources say got nowhere. A landmark deal setting off a global debate that won't end anytime soon. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, Vienna. I'm Richard Engel in Israel, where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued his first blistering statement almost as soon as the ink was dry. This is uh, a bad mistake uh, of historic proportions. Netanyahu has been criticizing the deal in tweets in Hebrew, English, even Farsi, the language of Iran. But in Tehran, they weren't listening. We did it! We finally did it! NBC's Ali Arouzi was in the crowds tonight. They're singing and dancing on the streets of Tehran. You never see these things. People are overjoyed and their kids are But in Israel, there's no faith the Iranian regime can or will change. Deal or no deal. No wonder there are everybody in the streets celebrating because they got everything they wanted and the West got nothing at all. Netanyahu said as far as Israel is concerned, the West just got hustled. The leading international powers have bet our collective future on a deal with the foremost sponsor of international terrorism. Israelis worry they'll have to pay the price if this diplomatic gamble doesn't work. I think he made a big mistake. Obama made a big... but. But it's, no one can do nothing. He decided, he was so determined in this mission. The Israeli government couldn't stop the deal in Vienna, but it's hardly giving up. The next step is to use Israel's friends and supporters to spike the deal in Washington. A retired general here in Tel Aviv told us Israel's next battle will be on Capitol Hill. Netanyahu is hoping Republicans in Congress will agree the deal gives away far too much. While Israel has been by far the most vocal critic, Arab states, especially Saudi Arabia, are also skeptical. They worry that Iran will cheat and that an emboldened Tehran will just make the Middle East even more chaotic. Lester. Richard Engel in Tel Aviv tonight. Thank you. I want to turn now to Chuck Todd, NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press in our Washington bureau. Chuck, how deep is the opposition in Congress to this deal? Well, look, it's pretty deep. Lester, it was really hard to find a Republican, either on the presidential campaign trail or on Capitol Hill, to say anything nice about this deal at all. Most of them criticized it before even reading the deal. That said, the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, admitted that Congress's ability to actually block the implementation of the agreement is going to be very hard. And here's why. While Congress has some oversight on what sanctions that the president can turn off, The Republican-controlled Congress is going to try to do that, try to reject the deal, send it to the president. The president will veto that bill. Then there's going to be an attempt to override that veto. Now, here's what it will take. All the Republicans plus 13 Senate Democrats and 44 House Democrats, when you look at the numbers. In every conversation I've had today, it is clear, Lester, that there is a hardcore 8 to 10 hawkish Senate Democrats who will vote with the Republicans on this and try to kill this deal. But right now, that's it. 
And the White House is making this argument to any other wavering Democrats. If Congress derails the deal, they argue the United States then would get the blame for having no more sanctions in place and allowing Iran to pursue a nuclear program. And, Chuck, there are those who are already talking about this as a legacy item for the president. But we don't know how this legacy gets written, do we? We really don't. It may take 10 years. You know, the president himself today did an interview in The New York Times, and he compared to what he did with Iran to Nixon going to China. Well, we didn't know whether Nixon going to China was a good thing for almost two decades. We won't know for at least 10 years, and that is the measurement being this. Will Iran get the bomb? Chuck Todd tonight, thank you. Now to the wild weather pummeling several parts of the country. In Kansas, a giant EF3 tornado touched down last night. Wind speeds up to 165 miles per hour. No injuries reported and only minor damage. It's Kentucky, though, that's seeing the worst of it. At least two dead, six are missing, and catastrophic flooding there. NBC News meteorologist Dylan Dreyer has more from the ground in eastern Kentucky. Scenes of destruction in Kentucky, a house slamming into a bridge as torrential rains and high winds battered the eastern part of the state. At least 60 homes damaged or destroyed by flash floods, which struck at random. You're looking at 500 homes uh, within the communities that are affected. Uh, you may find one home's been completely demolished with uh, the structure next to it completely fine. The water roared to a mobile home park, pretty much wiping out everything. It was all the way to my front porch. I had a chance to get my animals and go out the door. And by the time I got back to town, it was, everything was gone. Officials said emergency workers were going door to door today looking for people who might still be trapped. Almost 20,000 were still without power. The rising water swept away cars, one vehicle hanging precariously over a creek while others were partially submerged. The storms also hit hard in neighboring Indiana. Fallen trees, blocked roads, and damaged property. More than 30,000 homes and businesses were without electricity as crews scrambled to fix power lines. In Quincy, Illinois, a state of emergency was declared after winds of 70 miles per hour tore through homes and businesses. Back in Kentucky, the recovery effort goes on tonight with the threat of more rain and more flooding. Now behind me, state police are only allowing residents and essential crews into the hardest hit area of Staffordsville, Kentucky. We are also just moments away from another line of severe storms about to hit this area. In fact, severe thunderstorm watches and warnings, flash flood warnings are in effect all across this region. Tonight, severe storms are likely from Pittsburgh back into Memphis with winds up near 70 miles per hour. More flash flooding as well. Tomorrow, the threat is going to be less intense and less widespread, but the southeast coast could see the damaging wind gusts and the flash flooding tomorrow afternoon. Lester? Dylan Dreyer tonight. Thank you. Chicago authorities have once again named the infamous drug lord known as El Chapo as public enemy number one. Mexico is offering nearly $4 million in reward money for his capture. And now we're getting our first look at photos reported to be from inside the tunnel he used to escape from prison. We get more from NBC's Mark Potter. Even though Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is considered one of the world's most dangerous drug lords, some people in his home state of Sinaloa, Mexico, are praying for him. This woman says he will feed the hungry, something the government won't do. Back at the maximum security prison outside Mexico City, a flurry of police activity after the national and local prison directors were fired in the wake of El Chapo's brazen tunnel escape. Today, pictures surfaced in a Mexican newspaper claiming to show the tunnel and motorcycle used in Guzman's escape. They've not been authenticated by NBC News. This farmer who lived near the house where the tunnel emerged says he never saw anything suspicious. But he did see a white pickup truck go to and from the house regularly with two men and two women inside. This former U.S. agent investigated scores of other tunnels dug by El Chapo's drug cartel and believes he's gone home. He's a Hollywood hero up there, and they're going to protect him. But with Guzman's escape deeply embarrassing the Mexican government, officials are widening their manhunt. Interpol says it's now searching for him in more than 100 countries. Mark Potter, NBC News, near Mexico City. We have an incredible story of survival to share with you tonight. In the rugged terrain of the Pacific Northwest, a brave teenager recovering from her ordeal 
after living through a plane crash and fighting her way back to civilization. NBC's Hallie Jackson has her amazing tale. It's some of the steepest, roughest wilderness in the West, and Autumn Veach had been flying over the North Cascades with her step-grandparents on her way home to Washington from Montana when suddenly the Beach A35 went down. Rescuers never expected anyone to survive until this stunning 911 call from the 16-year-old. We crashed, and I was the only one that made it out. Are you injured at all? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of burns on my hands, and I'm, like, kind of covered in bruises and scratches and stuff. Hurt, but alive. It's a miracle. No question about it, it's a miracle. For two days, search planes circled, looking for wreckage. It can be very much like a needle in a haystack. Down below, no one knew Autumn was fighting for her life, the only survivor, following a river downstream until she hit a hiking trail, steep and difficult. After 48 hours in the woods, wet and cold, Autumn finally reached a rural highway and was spotted by hikers at the trailhead. They drove her to a convenience store 28 miles away where an employee helped her call 911. We're just impressed with her. Um, she's kind of like a superhero. Um, just amazes us what she went through, especially at 16. Her dad never giving up hope she'd be found. I just can't believe she went through all that she did. He brought her the only thing she wanted today, chicken McNuggets breakfast at the hospital and doctors say she is very sore as you might imagine and exhausted but no one would call her weak lester just 16 years old showing true strength in survival it's remarkable Allie jackson thank you still ahead tonight parents listen up we begin a special series on kids and screen addictions yes it is possible to draw them back we'll tell you about it also, beachgoers take mercy on one of the fiercest creatures of the sea when a great white shark ends up in desperate need of rescue. We're back now with a new series we're calling Disconnected. It's all about our children and how so many of them seem glued to their smartphones, computers, and game screens. For a lot of kids, the digital world can seem much more compelling than the one outside their windows. And that has psychologists very worried about where they're heading. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. Oh, you're awesome. oh, man. Oh, man. You're not excited? With three kids, dinner time at the Neely home outside Atlanta can be loud and silly. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Four-year-old Gavin, two-year-old Elise, and 12-year-old Tyler. But like families across the country, they've struggled to keep technology from invading family time, especially with Tyler. It sounds very strange, but I felt like he was... We were losing him in our family. A straight-A student and star baseball player, Tyler also loves his video games, iPod and Kindle. But he was soon spending three to four hours a day on his devices away from the family. He was totally distracted. Yeah, he was totally distracted. And Tyler is hardly alone. From smartphones and selfies to the Internet, the average teen spends more than 11 hours a day exposed to a variety of media. A 2012 study found half of all teenagers sending 50 text messages a day, 3,300 texts a month. And the average teen sends 34 texts each night after going to bed. Entire families now text at dinner. Psychologists warn concentration, sleep, and critical face time all suffer. Children aren't learning as much of the social and emotional intelligence, the cues that come along with having conversations, how to listen. Even Tyler realized he was digitally hooked. You start losing contact with, like, uh, the friends that you see every day. Your time is up. Finally, mom pulled the plug. No devices for a week, then limits on screen time. I begin to see him play with his, his sister, like, it just really opened up my eyes. I would hear so much laughter. The advice from the experts limit kid screen time to two hours a day. There's no substitute for the real world. Tom Costello, NBC News, Atlanta. Tomorrow in our Disconnected series, how social media is increasing social anxiety, what the pressure to get the most likes is doing to our kids. We're back in a moment with The Last Stand for a stubborn reminder of last winter. Two retail juggernauts are going head-to-head, -head and shoppers might be the biggest winners. Amazon has declared tomorrow Prime Day, offering huge deals on everything from TVs to laptops. Not to be outdone, Walmart announced it will also offer steep online discounts tomorrow. It's being billed as a kind of midsummer 
Black Friday event. Well, it took until the middle of July, but snow from this brutal past winter in Boston has finally melted. This time lapse shows Boston's biggest pile of snow, a dirty mountain of it dumped in a parking lot, melting from late March to earlier this month. Today, the mayor tweeted that finally this pile that once stood 75 feet tall is all gone. In the water, they're a fearsome predator, but on land, a great white is totally helpless. Fortunately for this young seven-foot shark, beachgoers pitched in to keep it alive. When it became beached on Cape Cod yesterday, they poured water on it until officials arrived, and it was tagged and released back into the ocean. When we come back, is Pluto a planet or not? We'll try to settle the argument on a big night for the small fry in our solar system. Those of you who remember what it was like waiting for those special family photos to be developed at the neighborhood photo mat may appreciate what NASA scientists are going through tonight. They're anxiously waiting to see if the New Horizons spacecraft, after a three billion mile journey, successfully snapped pictures of Pluto during its close flyby this morning. They should know later tonight, but already the mission is raising the profile of the little dwarf planet in ways previously unimaginable. It wasn't long ago scientists debated whether it was really even a planet. But suddenly, new images like this have made Pluto, our tiniest and most distant of planetary neighbors, a very big deal. All the hoopla is hard to explain, even for a renowned astrophysicist like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I still don't know. Pluto has been in our culture. It's a modern planet. It was discovered by an American. Previous photos of Pluto have been taken from across billions of miles of space. But now, 85 years after it was first discovered, Pluto is getting its close-up. Now that we have detailed images, and even more detail to come, you can say, oh, look at that shape. How did it get that shape? How did it become that reflective? One of the greatest aspects of what it is to do science is to reach a new vista and then discover that you can now ask questions undreamt of before you got there. At New York's American Museum of Natural History, space enthusiasts gathered early this morning to celebrate the historic trip. And as to that question of whether Pluto is a planet, or as it's now referred to these days, a dwarf planet? Pluto revolves around the same sun that we do, so... It, it does. It, so... Planet or not a planet? It revolves around the same sun, but while it does that, it actually crosses the orbit of Neptune for 20 years out of its 248-year orbit. No other planet does that. That's embarrassing. If you're a planet, you should not be crossing other people's orbits. For generations of us who grew up learning about nine planets in order from the sun, Pluto was last, the end of the road in a part of this neighborhood that was off limits. And now the question of what's really out there is finally coming into clear focus. NASA says the New Horizons mission is the first to explore a world so far from Earth and adds this mission completes its initial survey of our solar system. That will do it for us on this Tuesday night. I'm Lester Holt. For all of us at NBC News, thank you for watching and good night. This is DJ Shaheen saying thank you to everyone for listening to the Gospel Music Explosion right here on Vibes Live with Robin Lynn. See you later. Hope you enjoy the rest of your show. Peace. Before the second show